Laura, it's great to see you, and uh, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. Uh, when I read your book uh, two or three years ago now, and you kindly let me use some of the material from it, I was just struck by the fact that there were some really, really important sort of fundamentals that, that you spoke eloquently about in the book. And I, I know you've shared a conversation with Barbara recently, but I wanted to really just ask you to sort of pick up on these three themes, perhaps using a, you know, one of these slides one at a time, and just talk us through the, the fundamental elements and why it is so important. So the first one we're looking at is your concept of beware of Noah's Ark. And I have to admit a few years ago, this struck me, you know, I'd, I'd come across organizations that have done exactly this. And I thought, yeah, at last someone's flagging it up as an issue. So tell us a little bit more about it. How did you come up, you know, what got you thinking about it? Um, and why is it so important that we don't fall into this trap? Well, thank you very much, Matthew. It's, it's good to be with you today uh, and talk about these, these things. Um, you know, how I got into this notion of it, I just kept hearing as I was doing work around diversity and inclusion that people were just focused on kind of the numbers and they were focused on this sort of notion, okay, we just have to, have to make sure we have, the way I put it, you know, two of each yeah. um, kind of thing. And that seemed to be all that they focused on. So that, but that always seemed to me to be if just phase one or even precursor to phase one, this sort of notion, okay, we've got them in the building kind of thing. But the problem with all of that is, and I, I think I put this in the book, and I use a lot of animal examples. I'm on the uh, US, I'm on the board of the Friends of the National Zoo in the United States. So that's why I do a lot of animal examples. And as an aside, uh, the zoo has a new panda cute little thing. Uh, so that's just, yes, a little aside for that. Uh, but the way I put it is that you get all of these differing people, differing, you know, animals into the ark. And then the, the, you know, the giraffe turns and looks at the zebra and says, gosh, you're just funny looking, you know. How do you do anything with that stupid short neck of yours? You know, and I, giraffe, have beautiful brown fur, and you, zebra, have silly black and white stripes, and I, giraffe, only eat the freshest leaves off the top of a tree. And I don't know about you, Matthew, have you ever seen the junk a zebra eats? You'd never eat that kind of junk, right? That's so that's the point. If we bring all these people in, but then we have all of these unconscious beliefs and assumptions and perspectives and preferences about who other people are. So the fact of the matter is, is that until and unless you give organizations the tools to deal with the heterogeneity of this Noah's Ark, right? Uh, you're gonna be worse off than if you had homogeneity. Because Captain Phillips, uh, recently passed um, from Columbia University, had done fantastic research, and she found that homogeneous groups don't come to better solutions. They yeah. just think they did. Yeah. And heterogeneous groups come to better solutions, they just don't think they did. Right, interesting. Yeah, because I, I, I remember when I was working in a, a, a factory in, in, here in the United Kingdom doing some change work, that there were just purely in terms of gender, there were some very, uh, there were some teams made up entirely of women uh, making very small electrical components. And there were one or two teams made up entirely of men. And when you actually mix the teams up and got men and women working together, all sorts of new ideas, new initiatives, ways of working behaviors started to occur, which weren't occurring when the teams were gender specific. Um, and it, that got me thinking, uh, that, you know, there is something around mixing people up, um, bringing in uh, different views, different ideas, different backgrounds, different experiences. You get something special from it. Um, it's, it's, it's almost as if you get, it's not so much that you get something special in the sense of, of why should we be surprised? Yeah. When, 
when we say this is exactly what cognitive diversity is all about. Yeah. You are the only participant in this conference. Press any key to continue this conference. I don't know why we're having a little problem here. You've got a dog oh, and I've got a phone. <laughs> Um, so that's, the, and then the challenge is, is that, you know, when you get these diverse groups together, yeah. right, um, you have to make sure that it's a level playing field for everyone, right? And that's where, that's where it also, we get into trouble because what happens often is, is that you know, some people are getting overheard and some people are getting underheard, right? And some people are assumed to be competent until they show they're not competent. And some people are assumed to be incompetent until they prove they're competent. So we have all these sort of You're things the only bu bubbling up from this. I, 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 I apologize. I, I don't know what this is. Um, Anyway, uh, so that's where I suggest that this sort of, that people have to move beyond Noah's Ark. Yeah. That, that, that people get stuck in this. And then what happens is they get so focused on these numbers, if you will, you know, of getting them in the door kind of thing, that sometimes organizations that have been working on this for a, a while, they, they it end up sort of relieving the intake problem, right? Yeah. But they never figure out how to deal with the upgrade problem. Right, yeah. Right? And so that happens. Or they have all of these programs in place that they think are going to help them around this diversity. Yeah. And it's what's called Cheryl Kaiser's work out of the University of Washington. It's called the illusion of inclusion. Right. Right? Yeah. That people, what, so basically what it is is that people mistake effort for outcome. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah. So if, you were, if you're a young leader, you know, you're starting off your career and maybe you've just got a, a three or four, half a dozen people who you're responsible for. What, and, and, and maybe you're working in an organization where they've, they've sort of, if you like, they've got policies around diversity, they've got policies around inclusion. What, what would you be advising these young leaders to really focus on, to try and sort of build into their daily routines, the way they work, the things they think about, the way they react to people or, or lead people? What, what might be something that they could do of a very practical nature? which would really get in, you know, really, really make inclusion come about as opposed to just be something we talk about. And uh, I think that that's, I think you've hit it right, right on the head, which is that one of the challenges is around this whole diversity inclusion effort and sort of the unconscious bias effort that's yeah. been around for a while now is that it brings people to a certain level of awareness. Yeah. Right. But it actually doesn't help them with, now what do I do with that awareness? Yeah. What are the behaviors now? So that's a, perfect, that's a perfect question because as a young leader, you can start, you know, you can start systematically doing things that ensure that everyone gets heard, yeah. right? Doing things that make sure that everyone gets feedback. You know, because we know that like is comfortable giving feedback to like, but like is not very comfortable giving feedback to not like, yeah. you know. But we know, Linda Hill Harvard Business School research, two people start at the same place. One gets critical feedback, one gets stretch assignments, and one gets mentoring and sponsoring, and the other does not. In five years' time, there is a performance difference. So, <laughs> Excuse me. Anything a young leader can do to level that playing field, to make sure that everyone is getting stretch assignments, to make sure that everyone's getting critical feedback, to make sure that the mentoring and sponsoring system is in place such that senior leadership 
gets the visibility to the more junior talent that has been historically underrepresented. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for explaining that. And we're going to move on in a moment and have a look at the other two areas. But but that that's super. So really think about how you develop the talent around you and the opportunity you give to everyone um, rather than perhaps allowing your own biases to creep in or maybe even something like that. I could imagine even something like the sort of geographical um, you know, the, the distance or the fact that someone might be might be working close to you and someone else might be in your scene but working at a distance, but making sure that you're providing the opportunity for all of them uh, to get the mentoring, to get the stretch assignments, uh, to get the feedback. Okay, great. Laura, thank you very much indeed.